think the first time I fell in love with an old building was in White Cross, Georgia, where I was born and raised, a really small town. My dad was one of the founding members of the um, community theater, and they occupied a Victorian building that had an Art Deco renovation. Um, so it had been a vaudeville theater and then a movie theater. And, um, I have so many great memories there, but it also was the first place, I think, that the place actually had a personality. I mean, it was worth mm -hmm. loving. There were so many mm -hmm. memories and stories and, and everybody's friendships and um, uh, all the best stories that we shared as a group all revolved around this space. And so mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sure I wasn't conscious of it then, but part of the, the first time I, I know I loved a historic building was that building. And it was because it, um, it represents everything that's great about historic preservation, that you've got a continuity of human development, but then you've also got a lot of people whose current love and memories all revolve around this place. And from the biggest threat to historic preservation in Macon is a lack of development interest, which um, causes demolition by neglect and, and wholesale abandonment of entire historic neighborhoods. So our biggest challenge is to take advantage of um, the national revival of interest in cities and walkable neighborhoods to get people back in Macon, specifically Macon's 12 historic districts, to um, invest and make homes and businesses so that the buildings have occupants that can sustain them. America's demographics have shifted in a fundamental way that's changed the landscape permanently for real estate. And um, the largest plurality of, of homeowners households in America today are single person households which is a radical shift. 48% of households in 1960 were families with children. So um, you've got baby boomer, the two largest generations, baby boomers and millennials. Um, baby boomers are now empty nesters and millennials are waiting much later to have children, having fewer children and adopting many alternative lifestyles that aren't the typical um, traditional family with children in a house. Uh, that's just meant that there are, that um, the suburban housing boom in America the demographics aren't there to fuel it anymore. So most surveys think that we're going to have an enormous surplus of suburban homes over the next 10 years. Um, a rise in the new urbanity that was posted in 2009 predicts that we'll have 45 million suburban homes surplus, um, but a dearth of 25 million urban, urban ha housing options So over the next 20 years. It's just going to be a pretty radical shift that we're going to watch. Now here's where we've got a real problem. So we've got this huge opportunity with demographics and, um, and desire for walkability. Now as a preservation movement, we've got to figure out how to not only capitalize that to bring people back, but also to bring them into the preservation movement. Um, the National Trust found out that there are only 250,000 members of preservation organizations in the country. You compare that to something like a Nature Conservancy that has over a million members, it's hard to imagine that the preservation movement is so far behind the natural conservation movement, but we are. Yeah, I think there are um, just tons of people in America who are doing preservation work who wouldn't say they were preservationists. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for the movement is convincing people that when they move into a historic neighborhood and start working on a home themselves or move, in, move their business into a historic district and do rehab work, they're preservationists. And, um, I don't know what causes that. I don't know if there's some separation because the movement really started uh, resisting change and, and um, you know, political advocacy, and now our work's evolved to include a lot more than that. Um, I, I don't know what the hesitation is, but, but we're not getting through to enough people. There are a lot more preservationists in the world than there are members of preservation organizations. I think nationally one of the um, one of the challenges that continues to recur is um, the challenge of, of house museum management and it's appropriate since we're sitting in one and that's our headquarters. One of the ways we've adapted to that challenge is we've moved our offices in here, but financially it just wasn't possible to continue to operate the house museum and keep separate administrative offices. So I think there are other house museums that are facing even more drastic changes where the use probably needs to return to single family homeowner because that would be best for the house. Um, I think a lot of organizations are really struggling with that decision because at the time they turned it into a museum, that was the only solution. And now they can't generate enough funds to properly maintain the home. 
so a better solution might well be to sell it back into home ownership and keep the appropriate covenants or easements to ensure its continual maintenance. Mm -hmm. We've really multiplied our impact through that. Every house we've ever touched, we keep easements or, or covenants, and then we review them every year. And so for those hundred and probably 111 properties right now, they're always homeowner occupied. They're maintained in the same condition they were when we finished them. The landscaping's maintained. It's um, it's an easy, low cost way to ensure that the property is is preserved. <laughs>